Worst with The Real Texas Blog and today I have got a special guest with me. This is Kelly Escovito and the name of your, your farm is? South Texas Heritage Pork. Okay, and what we're doing is there's a big myth on how lard is not good for you. Well, the commercial lard isn't good for you. But when our grandmothers used to make biscuits and pie crust, and you know that really flaky, flaky, wonderful, delicious crust, well, it was actually from natural processed lard. So Kelly's going to explain to us how she actually processes her lard, and then we're going to take a quick tour and see the hogs. Depending on how fast you do it, it takes a couple of hours uh, to maybe three or four hours, depending on how much you're doing and how fast. And you want to go slow because what you don't want to do is scorch that. Mm -hmm. um, just as if you burn something in your oil, if you burn that crackling in there, you're going to ruin your lard, you're going to ruin your end product. Okay. So this fat is called leaf lard, and that is um, it's highly sought after when you're doing things like pie crust and so forth. And it is the lard that surrounds um, the intestines and other organs of the animal. That's the leaf lard. Okay. And so um, it's it's it comes in you know bulk form, and you can cut it into smaller pieces. It makes it a little bit easier to to render if it's in smaller pieces, because essentially what you're trying to do is these are little cells. Um, and these cells contain the fat in them, okay? Mm -hmm. So this one you can see still has a little bit of fat in it. Okay. okay, so what you're doing is removing all the fat from that cell, so what you're left with is the lovely cracklin. And the cracklin is, is, it's not skin, it's kind of just the cells that held the fat in place. And the cracklins, what we do with them then, after this cools, you wanna pour out all the lard. Okay, this is what it looks like when it's liquid state. And then you can um, seal that and refrigerate that or freeze it, and then it will solidify. And then that is in its, its uh, solid state. Um, lard, if you uh, don't refrigerate it, you don't have to refrigerate it once it's rendered. Uh, but if you do refrigerate it, then you need to keep it in the refrigerator. Okay. You can put it in the freezer, and you can keep it for up to a year in the freezer. Oh, wow. Um, and one tip that some of my customers use is they will um, line muffin pans or ice cube trays and then put that liquid once it comes to room temperature you don't not too hot put it in the, either the muffin tins or the ice cube trays and put those in the freezer and then once they're solid you can put those in ziploc bags and now you have single size servings for when you want to saute vegetables um, you can add herbs to those as well so you have a pre-season packet for when you want to do a saute vegetable you, you've got your little uh, thing of lard that has some um, fresh basil or whatever you've got in it. It preserves the, the fresh herb yeah. and it's a quick shortcut to your saute process. Oh, wow. Let's talk so. about the myth on different lards too real quick. Uh, I know that in the grocery store when we have the commercial lard, I mean it's like eating a bunch of grease, I mean not grease, but it's like eating a bunch of just wax or something. It's What happens is in order for, in a commercial environment, in order for lard to be safe, um, it has to be uh, pasteurized and the pasteurization process that they use takes a lot of the nutrients out of the fat. So essentially you're getting all the bad aspects of fat without all the value of this natural product. Um, this in its raw state has tons of vitamins and nutrients in it because of how the animal was fed. Once that pasteurization process happens all those vitamins and nutrients are gone and what you're left with is just fat. So that is an artery clogging substance that really doesn't add a whole lot of flavor, it's just fat. This on the other hand adds a tremendous amount of flavor, high in nutrients, and, um, and, and very good for you. So big, big difference in lards. Lard at the grocery store, if it has been pasteurized, processed, not good for you. I don't recommend you using it. This stuff this is great for you. I even have dietitians and even believe it, weight loss people that will come and buy this because this is a better alternative when they want fat than lard or cooking oils can be uh, because of the nutrients in this. Again, moderation, it is fat, so right. all fat in moderation. But I am learning that the natural lard, it has its health benefits for it you and so it's not that bad in moderation to go ahead and cook with it. We need fat to process our proteins. Your body needs fat, but it needs to be in balance. Too much fat is bad, unhealthy fat is bad. You need good fat and you need a little bit of it 
to process the rest of the proteins that you're eating in your diet. Now let's go ahead, we've gone to the commercial lard, let's now just kind of uh, take a little question on lard versus butter and on the health. I'm not so certain that I know the exact answer to that. My gut instinct is that lard is a bit healthier for you because again the pasteurization process in raw milk is the same thing when you're making butter. So again all if you get raw butter that is um, straight off the farm that's probably going to be pretty darn healthy but if you're buying uh, pasteurized lard or, or pasteurized butter in the, in the grocery store um, again especially depending on the diet of that animal it really everything that animal eats follows it all the way around the path to when you're consuming that product and so if that animal is not fed a healthy diet if they're fed hormones that's not good for you. So the alternative is if I have no fresh butter and I do have fresh lard, I'm going the lard direction every time. Now from my understanding, there are different pigs or hogs for yes. different things. Like yes. there is one that's specially for bacon. Well, um, hogs when they were originally domesticated um, were bred for different things. And depending on the areas that they were domesticated in, they were utilized for different things. Uh, bacon in its traditional form was um, any cured pork. It was a whole side of ham or a whole side of pork that they cured. Um, in America, we've kind of, in the last 40 or 50 years, have decided that the belly meat is what we call pork or bacon, mm -hmm. and that's what we cure to make bacon. Um, in, in other countries, it's still other parts of the hog. So there are different hogs, depending on where they were domesticated, that were better for different aspects of the pork industry. Um, two of the hogs that we raise are Tamworth and English Large Blacks. They are both um, heritage hogs. They were some of the first hogs that were ever domesticated in the United States um, and are both very rare breeds and that has to do a lot with um, um, raising hogs in contained environments. These hogs need to be out on pastures, they need to be foraging for food, uh, they need to have sunlight, all those things. Um, the dark hair, you'll see most of them have a dark red or a dark black hair. That helps protect them from sun damage, uh, from getting sunburned. Um, so they're great indigenous to this, um, to outside uh, habitats and uh, definitely not indoor animals. Um, so really good to have. The lard that they produce is very healthy because they're eating a lot of grasses. Um, their diet, these hogs, we feed um, a custom blend feed that we make on site. Um, we use a base of peanut and peanut hay. Peanuts are very good feed for hogs and and were a feed for hogs until, uh, in fact, Virginia had a law that, that hams had to be finished on peanuts until 1966. It was a state law in Virginia that Virginia hams had to be finished on peanuts. Oh, wow. Um, and so once we moved that into a more of a commercial confined environment, peanuts are not conducive to large, massive production environments. So you can't mass produce peanuts mm -hmm. enough to feed animals that are contained inside. So it, peanuts went away. Um, and so it's, it's not really something that anybody's doing anymore, but peanut is a wonderful feed for hogs. It's high in monounsaturated fat, high in proteins. They love it. It's sweet. It's a win-win for everybody. And there's not so much corn in their diet. Corn is, is just as bad for hogs as it is for us. And when we're looking at how much of our diet is corn-based, um, if we can start with our meats and get the corn-based out of their feed, then we're going to be a lot healthier for it. And then the lard that we get is much healthier. And you're right, it does make the absolute best uh, pie crust. I know that uh, feral hogs don't have bacon, and I suppose that's mainly because they run so much? Or? Correct. It's, it's very similar to what you'll see in our environment. The feral hogs are outside all the time, and they're running all the time. Um, and they're not getting a high-fat content diet. Um, we can really see the difference in a commercial hog, a domestic commercial hog, when you see how much fat they put on, it's that corn in their diet mm -hmm. that a feral hog doesn't get. That's why they can't get huge amounts of fat on them because they're out foraging for natural products and they're definitely not going through cornfields and getting mass amounts of corn. So definitely not a lot of bacon on a feral hog. Ah. Um, we have had, of course, feral hogs come around anytime you have hogs. Uh, we've had a baby feral hog that ended up on the farm that we castrated when we castrated our young and we raised him. Uh, to full size for a friend of ours mm -hmm. um, and that hog never really developed fat even though we kept him to full mm -hmm. size 
he didn't get a whole lot of fat on him, even though we were feeding him the same diet we're feeding our hogs. So they kind of do really do change, and that body structure stays with them. They look more like um, like uh, like runners, you know, mm -hmm. their body is very lean and very muscular, and that's how a feral hog looks. That just kind of seem. And, it, and, and they're fast, they're much faster than a, than a domestic hog. Oh, wow. Interesting to see that. Uh, probably the hardest part of this, and that is that um, we really love our animals. And it's difficult, the most difficult part of this is uh, to load one onto a trailer and take it to the processor. Mm -hmm. um, we spend a lot of time with our animals. We raise them for approximately 18 months oh. before we uh, take them to market. Mm -hmm. uh, typical domestic hog. Um, is about six to eight months time to get to the same weight. So you can see the big difference is when you're um, gaining fat slowly, just like, just like in our systems, if you gain fat slowly and you do it in a very healthy way, it's a good fat and it actually develops in the right part of the muscles um, and it gives the end product this overall nice intramuscular fat. The large black has the really tendency it's been bred to do that. And so you get a marbled meat that um, is not the other white meat. It's red, it's, it's beautiful color to it in contrast to the fat, um, and very, very flavorful and very healthy for you. The name of your farm is South Texas Heritage Pork Farm. Yes. And so now you've got the word heritage in there, and we know that there are the heritage hogs, and that you've got two of the breeds. Can you tell us a little bit more about what is heritage? Heritage is essentially has been passed on. It's like an heirloom. Okay, um, these were some of the first hogs that were ever domesticated in the United States. There are no hogs indigenous to the U.S. They all came over from other countries yeah. um, and were brought from different cultures. Um, these are some of the first hogs that made it into the United States. Two of the hogs that we breed are English Large Blacks and Tamworths. They were both domesticated in England. Um, the large black was kind of the Cornwall area. Um, it was known to be a lard pig. It gets fat um, um, on just about anything you feed it. Although when you walk out there, you're going to see our hogs are not really fat because they are eating so many grasses and they are foraging. But it does, even in that environment, it will um, retain fat intramuscularly. So it has a great benefit um, to the overall flavor and a great benefit to lard. Um, the Tamworth was originally domesticated um, in Ireland. It has an Irish influence. You'll see it looks like the procured Irish uh, uh, pig, uh, but was brought into Tamworth, in England, and uh, domesticated even further from there, and then brought to the United States. And many of the modern domestic hogs have been crossbred and crossbred to create something just like the, what happened with the chicken. You have the modern chicken that really doesn't look anything like what the heritage chicken used to look like. The same thing has happened with the hog. Um, when they talk about living high on the hog, the higher end pieces of the hog are of more value. So what's happened is um, the hog has been crossbred so many times so that the modern domestic hog is much larger in the, the back section. So you get a much bigger loin, a much bigger tenderloin, pork chops are bigger, all of those things, the rib cage is more rounded and larger. You get this really wide bodied, short legged, um, kind of squatty animal that looks nothing like what you're gonna see when you walk out here with these hogs. These hogs have longer legs, longer snouts, longer torsos. All of that is because they were actually out foraging for product. If you were if you in a, a, um, a concrete barn all the time, you don't need long legs and a long snout and long tusks because you, you know, you're, you're being fed every day. Um, so these guys need all those things. Um, they want to root for things. All hogs root. That's just indigenous to what their natural aspects are. They want to see what's under the ground. But they don't destroy the land and you'll see that when you walk out there. They're really respectful and they're actually good for the ecosystem. Um, they're fertilizing the ground as they go. It doesn't smell like a poo lagoon when you walk out there because what they're eating is good for them. So what comes out of them is, is just going right back in to replenish the soil. Um, so these hogs do look different than a modern domestic hog because they are grown differently. They grow much slower. Again, it takes us about 18 months to raise a hog uh, from uh, birth to market weight. Whereas a modern domestic hog, they can get that in about six to eight months because of the differences in how they grow, how they're grown, 
all those things. Again, also, modern domestic hogs are whiter pink mm -hmm. or some variation of that. It's really because they don't have a whole lot of hair because, again, we bred that out of them. You don't want a hairy hog when you want skin or some other product. You don't want all that hair showing in your hog, so they've kind of bred that feature out of them. Wow. But in the outside environment, they need that hair, protects them from the elements. Keeps them warmer, keeps them cooler, it keeps the sun from, from uh, causing them sunburn, all those things. Well, great. Well, now that we've seen this process, let's go ahead and see now where our lard actually came from. Nice. Wonderful. Those little babies, now you said they're about a week about a old? Week. About a week old. Oh my gosh. Now how many babies will, will one have? I think she has seven. Um, we've had as many as 14 at a time, but the average litter is about seven. Oh, that seven or eight. Adorable. Would she let you hold one? Or? She's a pretty nice mom. Black. She's an uh, you know, English floppy-eared hog. The ears, they believe the ears were grown like that because they uh, spent a lot of time foraging in briar patches and things like that, and so that protected their eyes from being stabbed. Um, their eyes are very, very light in color and pigment because of the fact that they're always shaded like that. Um, and they, they, it's perfect for this environment because they can eat cactus and it doesn't bother them at all. Nice extra little treat for them. Look at the babies, they are so cute. Yeah, the babies, though, the first day or two, they're, they're real trusting, and then after that, they kind of get a phase where they don't want uh, strangers around them too much, and then when they get a little bit older, they get curious again. Um, and, and if she's afraid she's stepping on one of them, then she gets more nervous, and she walks around and stomps around, and then she'll actually injure more of them, ah. just because she's nervous about injuring one of them. So it's just, we're really there just for moral support, just to make sure nothing goes wrong, to help her a little bit. Pure Tamworth, and um, she's, we have several of her sows here that are half. Mm -hmm. um, she's a good sow, she's a good mama. And her ears aren't as big. Hers are prick-eared, so they stand up. And so you'll see, you can tell the difference kind of in, in some that are hers. Um, even in here, you'll notice their ears will look more like visors. Mm -hmm. So they're not all, so like this guy that's uh -huh, looking at us, uh -huh. see how his ears are straight uh -huh. out? So so that female is a daughter of hers, or her sisters, one or the other. So she's half Tamworth. Uh -huh. And you'll see that their ears kind of reside a little bit higher up. Uh -huh. um, with the ones with the really long ears that hit almost their nose, those are the pure large blacks. <laughs> this one coming at us is a large black. Pigs really need to be, females need to be pregnant. That's part of their, their body structure is they need, they want to be pregnant. And so, you know, it's a constant balance between keeping them healthy and keeping them where their body is working at its best. Um, so we want to, you know, get them nice and, and ready to go again. You don't want them real fat because um, really overweight pigs when they start having babies is not good on them. Um, it, they, they have so many problems. It's just like an obese woman trying to have a baby. There's so many problems when they're super overweight. So we kind of keep them leaner, uh, but we, you know, we don't want them too lean either. I guess the tails, I've never seen a long tail before either. It's because all pigs in domestic production, the tails are cropped. The day, the day they're born, they, they clip their teeth, they dock their tails, and they give them an antibiotic and an a iron shot. Uh, we don't do any of that. Um, they don't need their tails clipped. The, the animal welfare approved label is the only one that um, is a third party source that you cannot buy your way in and they check from the day the animal is born all the way through processing. If your processor does not pass inspection for humane dispatch and handling of the animal at dispatch and after dispatch, you do not get animal welfare approved certified. So it is, it is highly sought after. It's even better than certified organic or certified humane because those labels do not check the processor. This wow. is the only one that goes to the processor and does an audit every year. They come and check our farm every year and they come and check our processor. It's a 204 point inspection and it is everything from how they're born, what you do every single day in their lives, all the way through the processing. Um, and, and there's strict guidelines, no antibiotics, no hormones. Um, it's all about the welfare of the animals. So if I had a sick mom that needed antibiotics, they're not going to
going to say, let her die. They would say, heal her, just like, you know, antibiotics are good, you know, to heal us. But what they don't allow is for you to use antibiotics. Antibiotics as a growth stimulant in a pork in, uh, environment is against the law. What's not against the law is to feed antibiotics in a low-level environment as a preventative maintenance drug. So for your label to say that there were not fed antibiotics as a growth stimulant, it's a big fat lie. They're still getting antibiotics. I know because all the feed on the market has antibiotics in it, which is why we custom make our feed. So animal welfare approved ensures that that doesn't get into your food system. Once a year, they do an audit before you are certified, and then once a year, they do an annual audit. And then if they see you are having issues, they'll do spot checks where they just show up, random spot checks. Um, our last AWA audit, 203 out of 204, we were compliant and um, excellent on. The one thing that we did not do was soil testing. We're new farmers, we didn't know anything about soil testing, we don't know why we needed to do soil testing. So they're helping us to understand why we need to do soil testing. Now we get it. We didn't know things like in a drought environment, grasses retain more toxins than in um, a heavily watered year. So you can actually be poisoning your animals by not having the right nutrients in your soil and having the grasses become toxic. So there are a lot of things that we didn't realize about that, and that's one of the reasons why they want you to test your soil. So um, it's a great it's a great label to... And now do you ship, or do you just get from your local? Uh, right now it's mainly local. I do have, because we are taking them to a USDA inspected facility, I could ship anywhere in the United States. I'm working on doing some shipping online. Um, we've built pretty much a good name for ourselves in this area. We're selling to a lot of local restaurants and at farmers markets. So my availability to ship online is somewhat limited. Um, if I had freezers full of meat, then I'd be happy to be shipping it all over the U.S. But I kind of feel like somebody paying an extra 20 bucks to ship it across the U.S. Um, might defeat the purpose when I've got people right here waiting for it. So we're getting there. We probably will be doing some shipping. We're also working on a local co-op where we'll have other vendors that are selling products in uh, more of a regular nine to five uh, kind of facility instead of just a farmer's market, which is Saturdays only. And it's, you know, if you've got kids in, in band or whatever, mm -hmm. swimming lessons, Saturday mornings are sometimes hard to do. So we're working on doing some shipping and some other things. So if our viewers wanted to get some pork from you or order it online or come actually and purchase it from you, how would they find you? Best place is our website, SouthTexasHeritagePork.com. You can find us at the Pearl Farmers Market on Saturday mornings, several restaurants around town, and all of that information is on my website. Wonderful. Now, the Pearl uh, Farmers Market is in San Antonio. Yes, it is. Okay. It is at the, the old Pearl Brewery site. Um, it is uh, being converted into a lot of things. They're putting in all kinds of uh, restaurants and little shops. Um, Lots of condos have gone in. They're putting in a new hotel where the old uh, brew house used to be. Um, there's a lot of development going on down in there. And there will be, right now they've got us in a parking lot in front of where the old um, uh, brew house used to be. But they're building a park where we're actually going to have a permanent uh, place at the, at the Pearl site. Um, they've extended some of the river walk to extend all the way down to that area. So it's beautiful. They have live music and cooking demos and educational items. Um, and all of the vendors at the Pearl have to be within 150 miles of that uh, market in order to become a vendor. And they have to be approved and they are audited yearly by the board of directors. It is the only farmer's market that I have been associated with that actually comes on site once a year and inspects, um, just like Animal Welfare Approved does. They want to make sure that what you tell your consumers is the truth. They really want to make sure that they're getting a good quality product in there. Oh, wow. And now this is Saturday mornings. Saturday from mornings from time? 9 to 1, and it's a year-round market. Year-round. Oh, wow. Well, this has been really wonderful. And it's it's just so different than what you actually think of a pig farm or a hog farm. And to learn about lard, I mean, I cannot wait to go and put some recipes up uh, for some biscuits and some pie crusts and... Uh, some other things. Well, this has just been so wonderful, and thank you so much for taking time today. Okay, I'm Ramona Worst with Real Texas Blog, and this is our good friend Kelly Escobedo with South Texas Heritage Pork. Wonderful, thank you.
in for stuff. They're finding you. Woo! Hey, Mom. <laughs> Be nice, Mom. In the winter, it's the ice cream truck. In the summer, it's just <laughs> They are 